Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Il Fuminati. I am your host, Ryan Fu. This is the We Are Denver Podcast Network, bringing all kinds of news about Denver and the local scene to you. I'm here with David Moak. How's it going, David? Doing all right. Good, good. We're really happy to have you. And we've got Stephen Sampson, who's playing with the computer a little bit, but he's going to come and join us in just a moment. So first off, how you doing, David? How's your day going? It's going pretty well. I like the uh, lead in music right there. My yeah. normal walkout song is uh, Chief Keef Loves Sosa. So this is a good <laughs> alternative to that. Um, a little different. A little different. Just a little bit. But I get you. you got to set the right right vibe for this thing. Yeah, um, I leave that all up to Rich. You know, We're here at the Ghost House studio. He's a music guy. He does all those things. I feel uncultured. You're somebody who's super in the music scene, yeah? You've, like, loved music and listened to music your whole life. I'm honestly not that guy. So I just love when stuff sounds good. I'm like, oh, that's pretty. That's really good. Um, but I like all kinds of music. What are your, like, favorite genres? Um, you know, I'm an emo kid at heart, so nice. I still listen to a lot of emo and pop punk. Um, if anyone ever needs a, uh, a two-hour all-vinyl DJ set of emo music, i happy to do it. Right. Um, Unique like, genre. Yeah, it's, it's very niche, and that's the thing. It's like... <laughs> Because all the records that came out that a lot of that music was like the early to mid 2000s. Mm. That was also when like vinyl was at its lowest peak in, in recent memory. So I have all these records that now they've reissued them all. But for a while, like I had this amazing collection of, you know, all the stuff that you would want to play. Um, so I just want to go out and do a DJ set one day. For vi but vinyl DJ set. Vinyl DJ emo. So I'm going to do three sets. A vinyl DJ, a vinyl rap and hip hop, and a vinyl um, like electronic what would you call stuff. that music that whole show to have those kinds of three to do them together i don't think i could do them together yeah. um, although if you do go to the emo <laughs> night dance party they do it like the marquee theater it yeah. starts out with like drake and that stuff up until the actual dance right. party starts so well, um but then again there's like a whole emo hip-hop world now too with acts like little uzi vert and mm -hmm. little peep yeah well that's part anyway. of it <laughs> i'm i'm remembering you said that by the way you will hear from me Cool. Oh, yeah. I'll be like, all right, ready? We're, we've got that emo party lined up. Yeah. That's right. It's, Here we go. I've been waiting four years for it. One day it will happen. Yep, and we'll make sure we've got the right DJ now for it. Vinyl emo music coming your way. <laughs> Vinyl emo. <laughs> How about you, Sam? So what kind of, what's your favorite kind of music? I don't really know. Uh, I tend to, my, my main go-to is uh, electro pop. Electro pop. Yeah, so, you know, kind of like indie um rock like name smarter songwriter but tending to have more of an electronic beady influence to it like mm -hmm. good just kind of like background work music but usually having a vocalist who is also singing a real song you know rather right. than just like a couple of phrases repeated over and over again mm. well we're here to talk about the denver music scene and all the kinds of things that are happening in our city our city's changing a lot fast um, and it's a good thing in lots of different regards, and it's sort of shaky ground in a lot of different regards. So that's part of the reason we've got this podcast, to interview different local creatives. Um, today we've got David Moak. So David, who are you? What do you do? What's your life like? So, uh, born and raised in Denver, mm -hmm. um, went to school at CU Boulder, but then came back down afterwards. So I've spent all my whole life in the greater Denver area. Um, I'm an arts and entertainment consultant, so I work with a lot of nonprofits, arts districts, um, groups that are doing things in the cultural realm, um, large institutions. You and I, you know, work together at the airport, some other stuff. But uh, I'm just a person from Denver who absolutely loves this city and loves the creative scene and does whatever I can to help it. Mm -hmm. Now I have no musical ability or artistic ability of my, my own. So don't make me do a drawing class. Don't make me play an instrument. But I'd love helping out the people who, you know, actually can do that. You could DJ a vinyl set for emo music. Yeah, I could do that. I, well, at one point I was a selecta, is what I used to call it, versus a DJ. Not that anyone cared. That's how, that's how, like, the era I was trying to do this, no one cared. Um, and I, the best party I ever threw was a party for every sorority girl at Boulder. Wow. I was the DJ. And, you know, that's, like, the perfect thing to do when you want to be an aspiring DJ. And it turned out that it was this benefit where we had to go through the decades of music, starting with the 50s, ending with today. So for the first like five hours, I played music that none of the girls wanted to hear. Like nice. I was told, you have to play 1950s music. And I'm like, well, they're not going to like this. So they yeah. come up to me, can you play this? Can you play that? Can you play My uh, Miley Cyrus Party in the USA? And uh, yeah, that was the last time I DJed. <laughs> so you progressively had to do like 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Was there eventually a point in the night where like they really got into it and you could? Well, it was a charity thing and they had a bunch of um, students from some program. I forget if it was a, a blind student program or something, but mm -hmm. they had a lot of um, kids out there. So at the beginning, it wasn't as much about a big deal. But like three hours in, the kids left and there was still three hours more of this. And, you know, by your sorority, you're like obligated to go. Right. So every sorority girl had to be there or at least buy a ticket. 
So just like watching them just get progressively more angry at me for not playing <laughs> the music they want. Like finally when the seventies hit, I think like it kind of got a little better, mm. but really it took until I could play the spice girls in the nineties before like I stopped getting death threats. Right. Right. Well, that's part of being a DJ that I've never envied at being a, uh, at a party is that if you don't carry that vibe really well, everyone hates you. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. So anyways, yeah, I had a friend who, uh, he, he wasn't like, he didn't DJ very much. So you'd never guess that he was pretty good at it, but he was really good at it. And I remember this one specific party, he was just kind of in a feisty mood and he was playing music that like people like, you know, a little bit too far out there. And a lot of people like, weren't really like, I didn't care. I thought it was great music, you know, but, um, a couple of people were like, dude, play something good. And he's like, what does that mean? Hmm. You you should just tell me what to play, and I will play that. And they're like, I don't care what you play, but play something good. And it, he likes being pushing buttons and stuff. And so he refused. He knew what they meant, yeah. and he refused to do it. Yeah. And like, uh, it actually started a fight at one point. And then like, once we got things calmed back down, he was like, I was like. I was like, all right, bro, I thought that was really funny. I appreciate what just happened, but <laughs> could you stop now that the art is over? <laughs> yeah. And he's like, okay. And then he just switched like right there in the moment like to another track. And immediately the party was like back on, you know? Yeah. And it was just because he's one of those guys who knew how to like get people in the flow. Yeah. That's a certain type, type of magic that I've always mm-hmm. sort of envied definitely is being able to control that like musical vibe. Um, I, it's also interesting to see if you ever see like a silent disco, how like, Without the music, being able to hear it, just watching how people interact, um, it's it's obvious and very apparent how much they like what's going on and how in it they are, you know? Yeah, people in Denver love selling discos it's right now. I think thing. they're so cool. It's, it's so much fun. It's I was, amazing. They do one at uh, Frozen Dead Guy Days, which I'm kind of, we're the official radio station for, and uh, yeah, that's why those show, cups show are here. Show it off, show it off. But they do a silent disco every year because they the, the town won't let them go late with music, mm-hmm. so there's a DJ that starts at like 10 o'clock and... Well, there's two DJs. That's the and reason it's, it's really so popular. much yeah. fun. And I really like the fact that you can just be like, okay, let's have a conversation. Now I'm going to get back into the music. Right. I, re- I, could, I really like to be able to like have music and a conversation. So. Yeah, usually it's one or the other. Yeah. Yeah, even like at various parties I've been to lately where they're like sort of networking and dance events, you go and it's like, for me, I don't know, maybe I'm just like an old man inside, but when it's so loud, I'm like, I can't talk to anybody. I got to shout over everything. And then I leave and my voice is all hoarse. And I'm like, ah, why? So I feel that. But also, uh, I did an activation at uh, something called The Square at Curtis Park. Um, I don't know if you got a chance to see that, but it was, they had a couple of silent discos there. And that was the first time I found out, yeah, there's a huge production upside to that, which is there's never any sound ordinance issues. Mm -hmm. So they had this public park that, the park could only be open to midnight, but they're like, well, we're doing a silent disco. And like, oh, no, that's going to be too loud. He's like, no, no, it makes no sound, so we'll be open to two. And they got an extended permit. It was super easy and impressive. So, mm-hmm. And the, head, the, the nice headphones have cool lights on it. So if right. you were riding past the, the party, you'd be like, what in the world is that? Yeah. I think almost everybody knows what a silent disco is, though, now. Yeah. yeah. Well, they've been like, doing them at the Great American Beer Festival, or Oscar Blues has, for probably right. a decade. So that was the first yeah. time I think most people in Denver saw it. But then uh, I remember doing one of the first when kind of the couple companies came with their own gear to start running their own versions. Yeah. Uh, we did one on the 16th Street Mall, and it was pretty fun. Brendan Brierley, Option 4, right. and his group, The 100, we partnered with them. And That's tight. It was, uh, it was interesting. People were climbing the trees. We got yelled at. But, um, yeah, I'm amazed to have seen the growth because these were companies that came in. And they were modest, you know, let's have 100 headphones, and now they probably have 500 each. Mm-hmm. And that growth just happened in two years. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a big deal now. I mean, I see them everywhere. Anyway, uh, <laughs> silent discos aside, our music scene is changing, whether it's uh, things like that or whether it's who's playing or what kind of music is popular. We've all seen that evolution, but I think, David, you've been close to it for a while. So what would you say is the biggest change you've seen in the last, I don't know, 10 years? in terms of music here in Denver? Um, that's tough. You know, I've been a little bit removed from the music scene for a few years as opposed to being in it. Mm-hmm. And really, the whole music scene is always cyclical. Everything it does, even the sounds are usually like, now you have mm-hmm. acts like Arcade Fire harking back to the 80s and right. stuff like that. So everything kind of just happens. You know, you could say that we've got more names coming out of Denver right now, people like the Daniel Ratliff and, you know, the Lumineers to a degree. But you look back in the day and we had Firefall. So you have kind of this this ongoing circle of things. I would say right now where we're at is on more on the industry side, you're kind of seeing new challenges and new opportunities arise and you have some new players in the game. 
For example, Metro State University has a for-profit music, music education school called Dime that has a building at 8th and Calumet that they're um, currently they're based out of like underneath the Tivoli Brewery, mm -hmm. but eventually they'll be over at 8th and Calumet, and this space will be a literal for-profit music school, one side more performance, one side more industry, potentially a program for music videos and like any sort of the filming related. But, you know, that's something that we didn't really have before. And I'm yeah, curious didn't to see even how it works. And, and for-profit, you know, at college education is a, a touchy subject for a lot of people. Mm. I just have no idea, you know, much about where this is going to go, but it's interesting. Um, so you see things like that, but you also see, you know, AEG just announced that they picked up two of the bookers, Adam Stroll, and uh, what's the other guy's name, um, from Cervantes, they're now part of their fold. And so you have kind of like fewer indie people, mm -hmm. you know, um, there's, but the other thing that's really weird too is there's obviously a lot of venues in Denver, but you hear about all these new developments that are coming in by people who I don't know if they actually have a clue about what Denver is. They could be from Miami for all we know, but they come in and they say, yeah, we're going to be taking over this whole city block in Rhino and we're going to put four music venues in it. Yeah. As like part of their master plan. Yeah. Like, well, we'll do a jazz club here and we'll do something here. And you just look at it and you're like, where do you think that's going to work? Like, I think that, you know, if you want to have one music venue as part of your whatever, and it can be multi-use, then great. But like these mini entertainment districts that are one square block in Rhino, I, I think that. It's not what Denver needs right now. Well, and not unless you've got a right partner. You'll need a big promoter partner behind you. I think they'll just be like, well, we'll just, you know, book local bands or whatever. And it's like, well, Appaloosa Grill does that every night. You know, there's a ton of places you can go and see music. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So Denver music scene is is always kind of changing. And I think that it's stronger than like the visual art scene mm -hmm. or the theater scene, or the performance art scene that's still looking for space. Um, I will say the one other thing is that when I was growing up around here, there were more opportunities for a person under the age of 21 to go see music. Right. And those have been cut significantly, and they've been cut even more for people under 21 who want to make music. Do you think that's just for alcohol purposes, because so many venues make money at the bar, or can, or that that's such a big draw, or what do you think that is? I think there's that. I think it's the idea of, I don't want to hang out around kids, be, you know, Seven Circle Music Collective, Less cool. Town Tavern, there's right. a few places that still let kids do shows. But, um, you know, when I was at that age, all the venues were all ages. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was even, this is back in the day when churches would still subsidize spaces for local bands and those would be safe and free, you know. Um, you don't really have as many of those and it's definitely a little scary to see. Yeah. But I don't think it's the end of the world because you have um, other institutions come in that can provide opportunity. Like I think what the MCA does, with their teen program, yeah. there's opportunity for them to book local teen musicians to play their shows. Well, you got like Youth on Record too when they do their giant galas. I'm always blown away by how talented the artists are. Yep, you know? but it's it's not like that, you know, Youth on Record has a venue, kind of, but it's at their gals, it's at their events, or yeah. when someone says we want to partner with you and book local bands. But it's not like a specific venue where you could have young people. Yet. I mean, if Youth on Record had, say, the Azatlan Theater, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and that became a space for performance, and that could be that kind of amazing all-ages venue. Um, and maybe one day they'll get there. Not that it necessarily needs to be part of Youth on Record's mission. Right. I think the recording side of it is almost more important than the space for live, because those still exist. But it's just different where it comes from. Totally, totally. Well, the music scene itself is changing, but also there's the festival scene, which has really sort of blown up over the last, I would say, five years even. There's huge festivals that, I, that I'm seeing get a sort of national attention that I never expected to see in Denver, Colorado, um, especially around these like sort of farms and uh, sort of social and uh, ecological permaculture spaces. That was something I didn't see coming personally. Um, like things like the Arise Festival that happened, and I always forget what that damn farm is called, but it happens on that, I think that it's big space. Sunrise Farms or That's something it. like that. Sunrise, and then there's May Farms, which is the one where Riot Fest was at one point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that um, the festival culture hasn't really expanded, but what has expanded is the attempts to like really overcapitalize on it. Mm. Like kind of everyone's rushing to the market with these kind of like wild ideas about, you know, I mean, there's like now there's like two every weekend. And there are a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's bad out there for a new event producer because you're competing with a lot. I mean, back when I started first throwing these events, you know, one example I like to give is Sculpture Park at the uh, Arts Complex. Yeah. When my group first started throwing events there, four or five, 2012, there were, uh, I think, five or six events in that park all season. Now it's up to 20 to 30 events to the point where they have to have rest days. Right. And, you know, that's insane. Like, that's absolutely crazy to see that growth in just a few years. 
What are, what are some of the events you've done there? I'm um, just curious if I've ever come across Sesh it. Sesh Fest was one we did, which is a beer festival where everything's under 5%. We hosted the Denver Flea once. You did Blacktop there, didn't we you? We did this Blacktop there, which was a, a DIY space throne art music festival. Um, what else have we done? We've done bike events. We've done, I did something called American Gladiator Bandstand once that I think Thad mentioned is one of his favorite events ever. Um, I agree. It was awesome. We'd love to do that again. And I'd love to partner with someone like Youth on Record for that. I think that there's a way that they could come in and make that thing really cool. Yeah, so yeah. hopefully one day. Um, I mean, I've thrown a ton of events. Um, and then we'd help other people who'd come in and try to like figure out because working with the city can be difficult, particularly with that park yeah. because it's kind of a unique park. So I'd help out like the Downtown Denver Arts Festival or... You know, my coworker Annie helped out with Top Taco once. Um, it's an interesting place, but go back to the festival thing. Um, Denver loves its weird niche festivals. Yeah. Like the Grilled Cheese Festival did 51,000 likes on Facebook or something. You know, it's, it's numbers you just don't see anywhere else. Yeah. Right now there's a pierogi festival that everyone's really excited. And that happens a lot with these events that kind of kick off on Facebook because it's so easy to watch it snowball with likes. Yeah. That you have these events that the... the you know, promoter probably didn't expect it to blow up like that. Like you have these groups like Bellarama that sit there and think this is going to be hugely successful. We have all this money, all these partners, and then it tanks while you have things like the pierogi festival that doesn't even have, I think like a, a real venue just has an address listed right? Yeah. and it's got 11,000 people interested. Well, Velorama, it was a, I didn't, I was like, why did you call it Velorama? I wasn't expecting music. I was expecting bikes everywhere, you know, and then there were technically bikes everywhere and it was in the middle of a bike race. But I was, I was like, Oh, Velorama, right? That's where you'd go see a band. I yeah. did, I think that was the real issue there. I mean, I live on on the block with Exdo, so Velorama like locked me into. Like, I was dealing with people that whole weekend. It was nuts, but um, I didn't ever see what was up with the the concert. So I take it no one showed up. Or not no one, but you know, relatively. Well, I mean, it, it no, there was not a big crowd there. I mean, it was substantial, but it wasn't you know crazy. The biggest thing is the site itself is huge. A bike yeah. race is not a small event, no matter what. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to have the music part completely separate from the bike race itself because, you know, it was in this huge parking lot. It's also like three city blocks long. I mean, I deal a lot with capacity and, and go back to the whole festival world. You know, one of the reasons that we don't see the super large festivals is it's been so hard to find a site. Um, yeah. But, you know, what we sit there and we think about how do you utilize an area and these groups like Bellarama come in and they thought, well, we can have Denver Flea come in and they'll fill a huge space, right? We'll have the bike expo that will fill a huge space we'll have a, a stage with bands that are normally good for a minimum ten thousand tickets you know we'll have space for it but they had even more space than that and so no matter what you did it always felt a little empty um and it was hard to get around where was velorama technically like the exact space blake and walnut like 35th 34 35 36 or something like that uh, no it wasn't quite it was more like 31 32 33 i think so they closed down all the streets for it was that, six yeah. blocks in each direction one block deep and then they took the parking lot right next to the rockies gotcha. there's a big uh garage and then it's you know goes down towards um like 38th area but anyways mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. it's it was huge and um you know, the, we can probably talk about the whole podcast just on Bellarama. There's a million stories from it. But one of the most interesting things, I like professional cycling. Like I do tour, tour uh, fantasy, fantasy tour de France with my dad. And what? Like, like aunts and uncles. <laughs> like this is a thing. And not just like tour de France. Like my dad does it for all the races. Fantasy cycling? So it's, wow. so you basically select riders based on, you know, 100 points. And you see how they do. And if they hurt themselves, you know, it's a multi-day race. Right. Um, tour de France is multi-week. They hurt themselves early, you're screwed. But uh, one interesting thing is the timing of Velorama is right in between the Tour de France and basically the second biggest bike event that's a week or two after when Velorama would have been. So all these big teams, they're just coming off of the most grueling race, about to start the second most grueling race. And this is, you know, not a major event. And so we're not going to get the best teams. We're not going to get the best riders. Yeah. I can enjoy a regular cycling race, but if you're not getting like the top of the top, it's not going to have the kind of draw that, you know, like Tour de France has. And no, like and not only that, they didn't have that many teams. Right. I mean, I don't know if you actually watched any of the racing going by, but there weren't that many riders. You know, you mm. expect to see this mass, like the peloton you see in the Tour de France. Yeah. It just didn't have that. Um, mm. but That's that said, important, yeah. There were other elements that were cool, like the idea of opening it up and having the community bike ride. I mean, just being able to ride around that. It's a cool thing to do, especially if you live in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know a bunch of friends who did that. They really had a good time. So it's cool, but you know, thank God someone else spent the money to shut down that street because that mm -hmm. alone probably cost six figures. Yeah, 
That's pretty crazy. I mean, the the whole idea of how much logistic and, and also money go into festivals and developing that space is pretty crazy. If you were going to throw a giant festival, um, which uh, many of which I could not even name, here in Colorado or here in Denver, where would you put it? So, as you know, there's a big music festival coming to Overland Golf Course. Mm-hmm. Um, Superfly is putting it on with some local partners. Um, I have been involved with that oh, from nice. the beginning. Um, we... We've been looking for a site for it since 2013, um, and you'd get close, and then it wouldn't happen. And there's a lot of different things you're thinking about when you want to have a festival site. And when I say large scale, really, if you want to go up to 20,000 people, you've got tons of options, not just in Denver, but just outside of Denver, some mountain resorts. Like, there's a lot of options. So what is large scale for you, capacity-wise? Up to 70,000 a day. Oh, yeah. So really, 40 to 70 is what we're talking about, because at that point you need such a big space anyways that that extra 30,000 people isn't that big of a jump as far as like acreage goes. So you still think about all the production and everything else. Really what you have to think about, first of all, is the size of your festival is going to be dictated by how many people can fit at your main stage. Because mm-hmm. the last thing you want to do is book, uh, you know, Paul McCartney as your headliner and everyone's out there for Paul McCartney and then half people can see him, half can't, mm-hmm. right? Like that's, that's something you got to be careful with. So you need to figure out where can we have our main stage? Um, the thing I think you see about a lot of festival producers looking at Denver for these large scale events is that they want to be in the city proper. You know, they don't want to be outside of town. They don't want to have Arvada listed or Centennial listed. They want to say Denver on the poster. They want to say Denver and they want to say it's in the city. You know, everyone wants to do city park, but logistically well, that place is tough. Well, I mean, it's oh, picturesque yeah. and there's neighbor issues. So, um, and they wouldn't let you, I don't know, I've never seen a festival like that at city park. No, they tend to limit you pretty strongly. Plus you're not allowed to do, I think, ticketed events there anymore. Yeah. Uh, maybe you are again, but they, they always kind of change their park rules. Mm-hmm. The last one that did it was Chive Fest. You guys remember Chive yeah. Fest? Yeah. So they also kind of screwed it over for all of us because they booked a band called Steel Panther. Do you know the story? <laughs> no. I don't know the story. I know the band though. Tell so us you, the story. You know, this probably this is going. So, uh, Chive Fest was a, for those of you who don't know, Chive is a website that post comedy and pictures of girls in yoga pants and I don't even know what else. I never really use it. Yeah. They love Bill Murray. Very, um, very dude bro. Website. Yeah. Yeah. It's me. It's meme culture, meme culture. Yeah. So, um, they threw a music festival and I think their headliner was like Edward Sharp and then their sub acts were like to And one of them was steel Panther. Steel Panther is a joke hair metal band that sings really dirty songs. Hmm. So, they're, they're very good. If you're not paying attention to the lyrics, you'd be like, Oh, this is really good hair metal. But, like, they're dirty. And when I say dirty, they're the type of music that, when you think about it, amplified to the greater city park neighborhood. Uh, People are going to be like, what's going on? (laughs) When you have a song like Dirty Asian Hooker, and part of the joke is you invite an Asian woman on stage who maybe has not heard the song and you start playing it, like, they're shock level type of stuff. Um, That was happening. And let me tell you, there's people who are not happy with that band. Um, So... And, you know, Kendall with UMS deals the same thing a couple times. Like Big, Big Fridia was an issue at one point. Um, even Place to Bury Strangers because they're just so loud. Mm-hmm. You're always going to have neighbor issues. So when you look for a big festival, you want a place that doesn't have those neighbor issues. But still in Denver proper. Yeah. And if you have neighbors, you want to incorporate them and include them. But it's yeah. going to be a lot easier for, if it's pocket neighborhoods than it is surrounding you um, and all that. You know, you, you need to really think about how you get in and out of the site, not just for like the attendees, but you need a production road. Yeah. If your headliner band late, you know, is late, their flight got delayed, and you have to get them a police escort into town. Like you better hope you can make them that last mile, and you're not gridlocked by traffic. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's a lot of cons- a lot of considerations that came in, and, and Superfly chose the golf course because it really did have everything going for it. There's a lot of improvements that golf course needed. I mean, I played golf in high school. We played that course a lot. It was one of the worst courses in town. Like, it's not a good course. It has history, but it's terrible. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, it'll be shut down for five weeks a year, but the amount of money going back into it and some of the building that will go around the neighborhood will actually end up making that place better with this festival than the festival never happened. I think that's something that festivals do that's really amazing, which is they can have a really positive economic impact on the whatever area they end up going into. Um, not always, but that yeah. can definitely be the case. Well, and so where are you parking people at Overland Golf Course? Because that was my first, like, I can't picture parking. So that is still part of what we're figuring out. And mm-hmm. my role is not going to be necessarily as much logistical side. I'm even not sure what my full role is. Right now, it's still kind of the pieces coming together, and I've just been helping out and, and working um, in different capacities. But most likely, we'll, we'll figure out all the surface lots we possibly can within a mile and a half radius and mm-hmm. do shuttles. 
um, really encourage shuttles from downtown, partner with places like Illegal Pete's or whatever that, you know, normally has a, a bus to show mm-hmm. pickup. Mm-hmm. Chiba Hut's another example place that has a bus to show pickup and, and really figure it out. Um, there are large empty spaces of land in some of the industrial areas we could potentially take over. But, you know, Denver's a car town and they were just out. The Superfly team was out this past week. And we talked about that a lot where it's like people still drive everywhere. Yeah. So we're going to have to make this a big consideration. Um, it won't be in the neighborhoods. You know, that's the big thing. We'll make sure of that by hiring people. Levitt says don't park in the neighborhoods. They're also not drawing big enough numbers where that's going to be an issue yet. But, you know, if it did, it, we're doing the same thing what they deal with, which is how do you have security or police or someone monitoring? Yeah. Yeah. I was actually just down there at the the Levitt Pavilion a little while ago, and I was sort of surprised how little parking there was within mm. the the park itself. I mean, it's a huge park. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of space, but not very many spots. And if they had a thousand, two thousand people come to a single event, it would, of course, it would spill over into the neighborhoods. You'd see tons of tons of issues. They have a little bit of a plan. Cause the three eleven show probably did. I don't know way it did, but at least did five thousand. We'll say. And so gotcha. I'm, I'm guessing that was their their test to see. And there's enough streets that you can kind of park on that wind through that that area. Mm. Um, a little How do bit you of prevent people from scooting out of the neighborhoods? Though, do you need like people patrolling those? It's it might, it's up to the promoter themselves to sit there and be that good steward. You mm-hmm. know, don't push that on your neighbors, particularly if your neighbors aren't 100 percent behind what you're doing. And mm-hmm. that's the other thing about these festivals is, you know, if you go and you bring a festival that has economic impact of these what these large ones do, you need to make sure that you're not hurting your market. Yeah, like you need to be a better leaving leave it better than you found it. You know, be a good neighbor the, for the whole yeah. city because you want this thing to succeed and you also want everyone to stay on your side and instead of having to fight things and, and you know some of the electronic music festivals that were in the mountains like snowball those had issues with the cities themselves they weren't invited back snowball hasn't been around in years cool well let's shift gears real quick uh tell me in terms of like festivals what's the coolest things you've seen what are some like innovative new futuristic 20 years from now the tightest things at festivals are going to be what um so i'm definitely a nerd and care about kind of different things a lot of people so on on one end i think um We've already run through the well of this idea of the leg of the reunion act. I mean, there's just so few bands that could reunite that would be massive anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I know the one most recently that like Austin City Limits was pushing was Live. You guys remember Live? Like mm-hmm. the kind of grunge band, exactly. Uh, <laughs> they'd have a song that I could play and you would know it immediately, yeah. but I'm not going to sing it. Um, mm-hmm. So you're running out of that, so you got to kind of think about what's new. Super Jams were there for a little while. Um, last year, I went to Outside Lands, or two years ago now, and saw the Muppets and like things like that. Those really amazing one-off experiences, performances. That's super awesome. That's what I think you'll see more of. And the, the Super Jams are in that same boat, which is the idea of like, what if Chance the Rapper and the Roots and you know Carl Denson are on the Work stage together, together or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, so you have that. I think the bigger thing is. Whether it's a new or old festival, people really do pay attention to the food and drink more than ever before. So yeah. having a really solid food like base is there. I think the Festival of the Future will also see more ancillary activity going on. So right now it's like festival and then after party. But things like even Bonnaroo now does a 5K on Saturday morning for an additional ticket, which I can't imagine being in Manchester, Tennessee in the middle of June and wanting to run a 5K <laughs> on the, a festival. the Saturday morning of a four-day festival. Like, <laughs> like kudos to the people that have the energy and the ability to still do that. Um, but I think you'll see elements of things like that mm-hmm. get focused more in. And then for me, you know, there's a couple different things. Um, one are going to be these festivals that are music and. So with Blacktop, which you mentioned earlier, we tried to make a festival where we, vis- we, we viewed the music and the art on the same tier. Mm-hmm. So we spent the same amount of money as we on music booking as we did on like professional art pieces that we mm-hmm. flew in from Europe or whatever, right? So now you have events like Day for Night Festival in Houston, which is, I think, truly one of the best festivals. I was supposed to go last year and Frontier screwed me over as Frontier Airlines does in the winter. Yep. But um what they have done is they took over an old postal building in Houston and it's got really solid headlining musical acts. Last year they got Aphex Twins first American performance in what a decade, but, um, and things like run the jewels and Odessa and clams casino and, and, you know, a wide range of music. Um, this year they're going in a direction too, where they're bringing a lot of speakers. So they're bringing in like Chelsea Manning and the pussy riot girls and some other people as well. But what they also do is these immersive creative tech visual things. So either a, a light, experience or a um, 
video map experience. Right. That's like, more of what I'm expecting, more of those kind of digital tech. The issues with those is you need a very contained environment and you yeah. need a pretty large budget because yeah. they're not cheap and you got to make sure that is this thing going to look like what you want it to look like. So the reason that Day for Night works is that it's in an old postal building. So you have this ability to control your environment, both with the lighting as well as um, weather, as well as attendance. So, you know, it worked really well for them to host a, a dozen of those. The one other thing that I think is the most interesting as far as like logistical side is RFID chips in everyone's wristbands. So this is not a new thing. It's been around for a few years, but every year the how people use them, people being promoters use them is getting more interesting. So now there's the cashless payment system. I love that one. Like most festivals that are large too, where you just load it up with money ahead of time. If you have anything left over, there's maybe a couple dollar service charge, but they mm-hmm. send the rest back to you. And that's not to worry about carrying around anything. Pays right. for, everyone has to take it. It's part of the rule of being at these festivals. Mm-hmm. The other side of it, it's more on the booking side, is you can use those as location sensors to see how many people are walking by a certain stage mm-hmm. or a certain food vendor mm-hmm. or a certain interactive installation. Or how long they stop there and how much their interest they're gauging. Yeah, yeah, totally. So you're getting this whole new set of data that, that you've never seen before. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's the most exciting, but also, you know, nerve wracking for probably a lot of artists that, you know, think of themselves as these big headline, you know, festival draws and then. Now we can see the data. The data may not show that, right? But that also could be really good for the smaller people who do a tiny little activation that's maybe not as loud, but that tons of people come up and really engage with. It'll show up in that kind of data, so that's good. And I think it would allow people to take more risks because Mm -hmm. I think people, once again, promoters, because they can see how something works going off of more than just... uh, you know, qualitative, well, it looked cool. It seemed like there were people there. Now we have quantitative data that says your food demo with Big Boy of Outcast and, um, you know, whatever food was paired with him. I think it was shrimp. Um, (laughs) You know, you can see, was that successful enough to justify the expense of having Big Boy come out just to do that? Right, right. Totally. Well, festivals are going on. That stuff's going to keep on going on. They're probably going to get bigger and and more expensive and hopefully more uh, engaging and entertaining. Uh, but also our venues in Denver are going up and down. We've got various DIY venues that no longer exist. You used to work at Unit E, mm-hmm. um, one of the more popular unit uh, sort of DIY venues that uh, is going on. Is Rhin- Rhinoceropolis, I'm not sure is how their stuff is still going on. Everyone's sort of shrugging about that. As far as I know, that. they did not come back. <laughs> as far as I know. Yeah. I didn't, I've not heard any confirmation that they are back. Yeah, I know they were trying to work through some stuff with the city, but it seems like maybe it just didn't work out. Um, so lots of different venues going down, but I know you're working on a new space. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that. It's called Understudy, that's the one? Yep, so we just announced it this past week. Um, we did a soft opening during Denver Startup Week just to kind of start demoing the space. Mm-hmm. But Understudy is really in a lot of ways revolutionary for Denver on many ways. Ooh. And it's not it's eleven months of work that led to us get here. So um my one of my clients is a group called the Denver Theater District. Mm-hmm. And uh it's myself, Annie Geimer, um David Ehrlich is our executive director, and then uh we have a couple other people that help out for project base. But really Annie myself and then who was Thad who was on the show last week um, or maybe it's two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. He's also part of our curatorial crew, but we are running what's basically a 700 square foot non-commercial, non-collecting art space. Mm. In German, there's a word for it called Kunsthal. One of those things that there's not an exact equivalent in English. It's not quite an art gallery, but it's getting there. Right. And it's this idea of an exhibition space that in my mind stems from the DIY scene. And this idea of what's the type of art that some of the best artists are doing that doesn't have a home outside of, say, a museum mm-hmm. or a gallery that's a non-commercial gallery that doesn't need to make money. But a lot you don't of have art. any of those, right? Yeah. It's a Q collection is more or less a Kunsthal. It's an area to, to go and do art that people can come and enjoy. It's very accessible. It's all free. Also um, very immersive. It's a space that allows for that sort of flexibility. And no one's selling you anything in it, right? right? Like you, They could, but they don't. Um, mm-hmm. So understudy is that kind of idea of what if we had one of those in the center of downtown, Literally in the convention center next to the light rail stop. Where is it? Yeah. So the light rail stop is 14th and Stout. We are a corner triangle unit right there. Like mm-hmm. there's a B cycle station. We are right next to the B cycle station. It's right by the big blue bear. Um, we're on the other side of the tracks in Blue Bear. So yeah, we're, yeah, we're yeah. Near closer to like Witch Witch and the pizza place. Um, but it's cool. You know, it's small, it has, but it has power, water, its own bathroom, internet, security, um, 50 people capacity, 700 square feet. But it's a space for these visual artists, performance artists, 
even some like music and, and people in other mm-hmm. realms that can maybe mm-hmm. collaborate to come in and just try things. It really is an experimental space. Have anything booked yet? Any ideas on what's going on? Yeah. So actually I came from there here today. Uh, Thomas Evans, who goes by the name Detour, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. he does some really great art. He's also the Oh, Denver yeah. Art Museum's artist in residence. I would say he's one of the more popular in Denver right now. He's one of the more popular in Denver. He should be one of the biggest artists to come out of Denver at some point. Um, I know he's still growing, and so I say at some point, see how big he gets. But he's partnering with uh, DJ Kavum. Do you yeah. know DJ Kavum? Of course. So, yeah, of course, I don't know who we're talking to here. <laughs> um, so they're going to do a collaborative thing around this uh, theatrical hip hop dance convention coming at the beginning of November. So they'll end up being a, an, a detour art installation in the space that eventually gets programmed with activity by DJ Kavum. That some of it's going to be that sprout that life, you know, mixing hip hop and eating healthy. Some of it will yeah. be his play with your food where he plays beats with food. Um, Gangster gardener. Yeah. And then at one point it'll even be a pop up juice bar. Ooh. Where it's like, because all these kids will be going to this hip hop theatrical dance convention. Uh-huh. And rather than send them to the 7 Eleven across the street, have them come and get some free cold pressed juice or whatever he does because mm-hmm. he, he has his own juice line mm-hmm. um, or juice juicer line which is even crazier than having a juice line is having your own <laughs> juicer line um, so like that's coming up following that uh, we have a dream poet in there his name's uh, Matthias okay. he's from Denver you can look him up he's definitely done some big stuff sorry dream poet so what is he, that so I can't I don't explain it well because it's really I don't fully understand it mm. but he he writes your dreams and delivers them to you so, in poetry form. So you get a 30 day <laughs> subscription and what he'll do is at like two in the morning, he rides around on his bike and like delivers your dreams. When you wake up, you can read about your dream, I think. So I might be slightly That's off, but it's generally tiny. that idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he'll take our space. He's never had like a physical space before. And this kind of came to us um, through our partners at Nine Dot Arts. Mm-hmm. So they were doing something. Um, he was doing something potentially at the Temporary Art Museum at Boulder, mm-hmm. but they've had a little bit of turmoil up there. And so he, he ended up not doing it. Um, and we kind of picked it up because they hired someone who had worked with the Boulder Contemporary Art Museum and it just all came in our path. But it's great. So he'll be really cool. Pop up record store with the band Rubedo. Yes, They're going to cool. re- release their album there. Nice. Um, Everyone loves Rubedo here. Well, and their art was done by Mike Giant. If you guys know Mike Giant's work. Oh, tell me a little bit more. I've heard that name before, but he does do um, black and white like drawings, like almost. He does some that look like kind of flash paper style. Um, I think I know who you're talking flash about. Flash paper, flash sheets, whatever, like the tattoo sheets are yeah, yeah, yeah. it's called he's really great um he did their artwork you'd know his stuff immediately if you saw it so it's also going to be showcasing his work that he's done with the band Rebato showcases their things i'm gonna have a pop-up record store in there and sell my emo collection <laughs> except for a two-hour set i'm gonna sell everything else um, <laughs> for real and then uh we'll have potentially some other local band local artist opportunities just kind of depends on how the space fills out of course and the most exciting that we have on this calendar year and there's a couple other little pop-ups too but uh this one artist, Jonathan, I think his last name is Saiz, is how you pronounce it, S-A-I-Z. He is basically creating this little like hexagon box that he'll sit in and create these two inch by two inch custom oil paintings. Um, he does it already. You might have seen his stuff around. He's really smart, but he's looking into new ways to monetize art for the artist. Mm. So he's going to be sitting in this cube for like 22 days, 12 hours a day painting. And then when he's done with a piece, he puts it in a little plastic case and puts it on the outside of his cube. And you can't see him doing this. Like it's it's a enclosed. Enclosed, cube. yeah. Then people can come in, take one of those, write down their name and email, and then walk out with it. And then he will invoice them later twenty dollars per painting. And then it's literally a trust system about other people actually pay that. Aww. And so his whole thing is he no one could pay or everyone could pay, mm. but he wants to try this to see how much people do pay. And I feel I, like it's going to be like 100%. That's I don't my think opinion. so. Really? I think it's going to be closer. I'm, I'm going to be shocked if he breaks 50. Really? Because I think people write down their email address wrong or read their handwriting. I think well, people will yeah, forget okay. about it. Yeah. It's also like this is going to go from like December 4th through like the 24th. And so it's right around Christmas time. I would love someone who maybe has lower income, who's taken the train home, stops in there, gets a couple pieces for their you know parents or whatever it may be. And uh, that could be incredible. Like there's elements right. of it that I think be really neat. And I give Jonathan a lot of credit for using this space, which is what we want it to be, an experimental space, to its fullest, not just in his concept, but in his way of operating. I think that's really where art is expanding. Art is no longer just something you look at. Art is something you take part in. And whether it's, uh, like the MCA does all kinds of cool stuff regarding that regard, like in Failure Lab, and we had Andy on talking about that stuff, or it's that kind of uh, 
sort of trust system building. Those are those that's that's real art. Um, what was the one Andy did? Oh, she's taking people's hair. Have you heard about this? She she went up to strangers and took clippings of their hair, um, and and would do did a whole art piece on it. Anyway, I love pieces that are not just sit on a museum wall and you come in, oh, that's pretty, oh my, and then you move on. But it's something much more than that. It makes you question who you are and, and what uh, what art is. So I just think that's great, man. Congratulations on, on opening in the space. Thank you. The big thing for us is to let the artists themselves dictate what is the space and yeah. what does it do. Yeah. And when I say that, I mean, we tell them what they can't do. You know, there's a little space you have to keep open for fire mitigation. You know, you, you can paint apparently on the ducks, but not on the instruction labels on the ducks, mm. right? Things that we can't do, but the way we find those out is we let the artists tell us, what do you want to do? If you could do anything right now within your budget, we've got about $5,000 in install. Yeah. So this year we have a little bit less perks, kind of came on a little late, but uh, you know, next year will be a minimum of like $5,000 per person to come in and say, what would you do with that? Plus free rent, plus all of our equipment and gear, plus we'll pay for damages. Like, so it's That's really incredible. Cool. Yeah, it's one of a kind. Um, and really want people to go and say, this is what I want to do. Let's learn together. It's okay to fail in the space. Right. It's okay to make something that doesn't live up to its full potential. So it's a real incubator space. And yeah. there's no, you know, we think we found the people who have their stuff together enough to not totally fail. But at the same time, I'm pushing these people to do something different, do something mm. more. So mm. The dream poet has a physical space, you know, like that's a, a, a extension beyond what he's done before. Um, Keep an eye on it. It's literally at the construction uh, convention center light rail stop. It will start being activated in the next couple of weeks, and then it will be on and off with art installations. Some you go inside. Some you may just look inside. Right. Some may be more pop-up event-based. Some may be more just visual gallery type. But over the next two years, we hope to, to showcase that you can go downtown and see something really, really cool for free. You know, this is accessible. This is not to say that there aren't free days at the other museums, but right. like, if there's ever a charge to get into this place, it's either because A, it's part of the artist's vision, or B, it literally has to do with capacity issues, right. where we have to figure out, you know, how to slow limit. it down. Yeah, and that's what you should you use ticketing for. Yeah. Interesting. Well, that's awesome, dude. Congratulations. Thank and you. If you're out there, go and check it out, Understudy. Uh, is there a website people can check out? Understudydenver.com. <laughs> easy peasy. Cool. Um, yeah. And I, is that Denver? Is the, is the money coming from like a Denver arts grant kind of situation? Yeah, like, that was my second question. So that's a very good question. So it's also unique in how it's funded. So my nonprofit Denver Theater District controls the LED screens and billboards in downtown Denver. Mm. And we started because the city had a moratorium that said no outdoor signage starting about the late 70s. Um, I forget the exact year, but we'll say 78. They said we don't want any billboards downtown. Yeah. Then the city eventually built the Colorado Convention Center. And when they built that, um, tourism took up, you know, everything else went up. And so you started to have these vendors, and these people saying, we really want to advertise our booth. We want to advertise our product. Are there any ways for us to advertise downtown? And that's when the city started installing some of the LED screens you see on Spear. Now, what ended up happening is 2009, um, so people had this idea, let's create a signage overlay plan that allows for LED screens or billboards. But Instead of it being like a Times Square, New York, where every screen is owned by someone different, yeah. um, this one, this is a, all the screens have a central beneficiary, which is the theater district, a 501c3 nonprofit that takes 15% of the gross revenue and gets 15% of the time. So I actually just worked at the Colorado Business Committee for the Arts, do an economics, not a full economic study, a cultural impact study mm-hmm. to see what we've done. And we've given away like a million dollars in free screen time and billboard time. You know, we've done huge numbers of uh, employment and huge numbers. I wish I had the numbers in front of me now because they're really awesome. But we've actually been able to see our impact paid out from the screens and billboards almost exclusively. So that helps fund this particular understudy project. So understudy has no tax dollars as far as the programming goes. Gotcha. But it is a city-owned venue that yeah. Arts and Venues is letting us use because it had been sitting empty for seven years. Yeah. Like, not even Dunkin' Donuts could use it. And Dunkin' Donuts can use anything. I mean, it's <laughs> donut shop. Like How come? What prevented it? Just um, awkward it's or too what? too small. It's too awkward. And you don't really have a good, like, loading area. Yeah. So when we do our load-ins, load-outs, we'll have to pull meters. But, like, if you're Dunkin' Donuts, you don't have quite enough space to do a full um, kitchen. You have to maybe truck in those donuts. Mm-hmm. Even delivery of those would be a pain in the ass. And so it gets to the point where this space... The last thing it was used for was a leasing office for the Spire, which is the apartment building across the street. Oh, yeah. That thing's been fully leased now for, I think, six years. So it's a good opportunity. And so, yeah, so we get the money from private. Any other funding that goes into the space, if we end up doing some grants, it would be the artist would lead the grant and we'll be the co-sign 
group on it because gotcha. we don't need the money. We're fully funded. We're able to do this thing how we want to do it. But some artists may need more money to make their vision go further. So we'll help them go through the grant process. Nice. Um, That's got to look good to someone who's a grant committee who sees that this person has this backer already and you just need that little extra push. And yeah. we've been great with that before. Like, oh, heck yeah, the street arcade that we helped mm -hmm. throw. Mm -hmm. Brian Corgan's idea, genius. It was awesome. We were that nonprofit partner who also owned the screens who co-signed his application for his big $200,000 oh, yeah. grant he got. That makes a huge difference, especially because if you're not like the only funder for that grant, that's that's one of the number one things that they ask for. You know, Who else is putting money into this? And when we're matching, and we can say matching cash of five, and then if they need to, to see the trade, wow. you know, you could have an artist that's going in thinking they can do this installation for five grand, having 10 grand. Right, um, and they could do so much more. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we'll see where it goes, but... The only other time a theater district ever gets any sort of money would be a couple sponsorships here and there. And then every now and again, we work with the city in some way. But those days used to be earlier on, back when they didn't have the staff they have now. Mm -hmm. So all well, my money for understudy is private. That's sick and super awesome. Yeah, dude, congratulations. Well, you got to realize that that's also a positive because it kind of takes out the whole public art component. Right. Like, we don't we do art public art to a degree, but it's art for the public. Yeah, because, not funded by the public. Yeah, we yeah. don't have a... a Deaccession or a you know plan where we need to pull something away that's super convoluted that no mm -hmm. one can get rid of it you know mm -hmm. like the broken art piece at the light rail stop that convention center they can't really get rid of that because it's so complicated to remove a piece of public art which one is this I don't know this story. um it's this so there's this weird piece at the convention center light rail stop that's like a metal thing that's supposed to be that's right outside of understudy right it's that's yeah it's like the on corner. the back wall yeah. it's literally right over by like where you buy your ticket for the the train um looks like a cool piece it just never worked for tech reasons or something but it doesn't matter even if it doesn't work because the rules for public art and how it goes mean that it doesn't matter whose fault it is it's still just not going to work and still have to live there yeah decommissioning any kind of public art is is an incredible hell i know D, uh, dia has those issues all the time there are tons of pieces they want to take down but it's like literally like a five-year process to take everything down and people change jobs and it just it makes it pretty complicated so it's nice to kind of, public art sits on our team. Like their arts and venues is on our board. Michael Chavez runs Denver Public Art, mm -hmm, Rudy. Mm -hmm. Like these are great people that we work with regularly and support what they do because we have an outside funding stream and there mm -hmm. are times where it makes sense to partner, um, especially when it you know serves the wider community. But the biggest thing I want people to understand with Theater District is we mainly do free programming other than incubating events like Sesh Fest or something, um, which we were a part of, but we, you know, we were more to kind of help launch it help with the site, help yeah. with operations. But we, you know, we, we're a unique group and our model is so cool that they are starting to look at it in other cities. So Atlanta just picked it up. Um, we're talking to San Jose, but Sacramento, San Jose. Mm -hmm. So it would be really cool to see this idea spread because as you all know, arts funding is tough and to have this new stream of revenue yeah. is really substantial. I mean, I, you've seen it. We've been able to make an impact in yeah. individual people's lives yeah. because of this private funding. Well, I think it's also amazing because people consider art, like you said, publicly funded as sort of a, a burden on the overall structure of budget and things that happen to the city. But the truth is that things like the screens are ultimately public space, right? Yeah. Like they're, they really are, that really is a public asset, that screen. So a percentage of it should go to supporting cool things that could end up being advertised on that screen. So it just makes sense. It's a cool cycle, and I love it. I hope I see it all over the world. You know? Well, and billboards, and my executive director can say this better than I ever can, but the other thing that's interesting about billboards, when you think about it, they're forced onto you. Almost yeah. every other time you're advertised to, there's always getting something in return. So you can click the X button or something. Click the X button, yeah. but they're also, that's how they fund the you know website. Mm -hmm. Or it's, you listen to the radio, so commercials on the radio to help fund the content. So you're like directly that. contributing to whatever it is you're taking part in. A billboard, billboards, nothing. Nothing at all. There's just no forced into your eyeballs. No public benefit. And yeah. so we try to create this sort of, and we're not a public benefit company, so we're 501c3, but we tried to say, if you're going to force this on us in a town that said no billboards for decades, right, right. we want to be a beneficiary. And I think where you know, our revenues are well over half a million dollars a year, we're about to do a new screen that's really interesting on the side of the Westin that's going to be projection and LED. Mm -hmm. So creating art content for that is going to be so awesome. Because well, as I said, we get 15% of the time. Right. Well, that's so awesome. And to see like different cities like New York and LA where like Coca-Cola and all these other giant advertising screens could have really cool, innovative, either local or just artistic content generally. And it's not possible because these giant corporations own these screens. And frankly, it kind of dirties the city up, you know? 
I couldn't believe when I first went to L.A. how many of those straight-up buildings, skyscrapers, which like the entire side of it was an advertisement. To me, that's just, I don't know, it doesn't make me want to buy Coca-Cola, that's for sure. But also, it's just sort of an eyesore to the overall structure of the city. So, you know, I, I, I hope that that also influences the way that we see advertising, the way that we see how it's a public resource and stuff. Okay, it's what, really cool. What are the current rules for advertising on those screens? Like, what... So is there a specific rule set? So there's well, there's kind of two sets of rules. Um, one is just in general, if you're an advertiser, like we'll use Coke as an example. There's a design review committee that has to make sure everything is there. And one of our rules is that it has to be artistic in some way. Yeah. So don't just go and, and take your... You can't just flash a logo. No. Um, you got to make it at least somewhat cool in some way. Um, and to be honest, the way that Theater District was written, and this is before I joined about 2000. Officially, 2013 started in 2012. Um, 2009, when it formed, so a few years before me, they they could have done the rules better. So Atlanta, for example, is actually has a better rules than what we do here. But um, generally, they have to be aesthetically pleasing and artistic in some way. No political ads at all. I don't care what side you are on. We're just not going to touch it. Uh, good, good. No yeah. tobacco. That's a city rule. Good. Um, mm. Marijuana, we can't touch. We can do maybe weed maps and stuff. But like, can't touch any of that. Mm-hmm. Um, that's really about it. You know, it's it's kind of a pretty open field. What about that. for the fifteen percent? That's so that's what's cool. So that's used for a few different things. One is theater district programming. So if I need to, I can take over the screen as part of rotation and show art. So put it together a fifteen second art clip, which we've mm-hmm. done before. Or I can use it to promote an upcoming event. Or even just something cool happening downtown, like that Southwest Plaza ice skating rink that right. I don't think it's Southwest anymore. But, like, mm-hmm. it's free ice skating downtown. I'm more than happy to showcase that. I'm happy mm-hmm. to advertise Parade of Lights. Like, so, again, are, it's that idea that it, it's it's part of the public asset and it's there to, for everybody. But what's really cool about ours is that I also, so my time is supposed to also be spent on helping nonprofit arts organizations. Mm-hmm. So I've given time to everyone from um, Denver Gay Men's Chorus to Wonderbound, the modern dance company, to Think 360 Arts, which is mm-hmm. an arts education group. Mm-hmm. And um, what's really cool to... Uh, Golden Triangle Arts District, which you gave District. Black Actors Guild some time one time. I really appreciate it. And so that's the thing is that I can use it. And what's really neat is one, it's whether how much value do people really get out of that? You know, mm-hmm. how many eyeballs are seeing it? That's up for debate. But what's really interesting is when you can take that number, figure out the actual donated value of what I gave you, you know, your organization. Use that when you're going after future grants or sponsorships or, or pitches because mm-hmm. you're sitting there and saying, this cultural partner gave us initial three thousand dollars in marketing exposure this past year. That's a big deal for a lot of these small arts organizations. Totally, um, and, and it's a big deal for the granting process when yeah. you're moving forward with it. Yeah, and, and just in general, just showing growth. And and so mm-hmm. it's one of those things where to me, it just they have to make them to spec. Each screen is custom, so they have to make custom sizes, and then we run them. But the value that the organizations see, even if it's just everyone likes seeing themselves on the big screen, just seeing their their logo up there or their advertisement. They're great. And I'll tell you that like certain groups like Wonderbound, the content they put together, people wouldn't even know it's an ad. Like they right. might, if they don't know what Wonderbound is, they just saw something that's really pretty and seems like, you know, this could be interstitial on PBS, like something really cool. I love Wonderbound. We have to get some of them on, on the podcast because they just do great work. I've been to one of their things, with, which was really cool. It was uh, the Flowbots. Um, actually, I think that's the second time they've worked with the Flowbots now that I say that. But very recently they did a... It's actually kind of like a, they weren't done with the show. They just did a pre kind of showcase mm-hmm. at uh, the Arvada, Arvada Center for the Arts, and it was really fun. Very cool. They just played the whole album and then they, you know, choreographed it essentially. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're probably one of my favorite arts groups by far out in Colorado. Um, awesome stuff. Highly recommend it. Even if you don't like, like, I was not into dance mm-hmm. generally. I love going to their performances. They did this one with mm-hmm. Seven Deadly Sins. It was like a Looney Tunes right. cartoon at times. Like a lot of slapstick, and they're so talented. The, it's just really sad going back to the venues. There's nowhere in Denver proper they can really play. You know, yeah. they're playing the Arvada Center, the Pinnacle Center, or the Pace Center. And Pinnacle's a school up north mm-hmm. by Waterworld. Mm-hmm. And the fact that Denver doesn't have a 500 person seated performance hall room that's accessible, that isn't super expensive with union costs, or whatever, but even without those, we just don't even have a room. Yeah. Um, groups like them really need it. And that's just. It's not good. Well, yeah. hey, those people in Rhino who are putting three concert venues in the same block, maybe they should be. I've uh, been trying to pitch that to them. You know, that's the thing, especially because the few seated theaters that still exist, the one on South Broadway is now, uh, you know, the Kitties is going to be a, a distillery. Yeah. So we've lost one more. And um, 
we'll see what happens to the Fox. You know, we'll see what happens to the Azatlan. We'll see what happens to Oriental, but which isn't necessarily a seated room. Yeah. Um, but even Azatlan, I know the guy that owns sure. Oriental. He's a really good dude. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, I don't know if he is now. He was on the board for uh, Denver City Park Jazz. And um, I did, uh, I recorded their stuff for their 2016 season. And he's a really good dude. He's Very a really, good. He's, yeah, he's got a lot of, I actually talked to him a little bit about like a local showcase kind of night. And he was like, yeah, that sounds like a Thursday thing or once a month. Yeah. And I haven't really ever caught back up with him, mostly because we started this whole thing. But Well, relatively small venue owners or venues that are even owned by like an individual person, generally pretty awesome. Because yeah. it takes so much work to it run does. a venue. It's an incredible, incredible effort. He's definitely an advocate. Like, Good. He, he is a musician himself, but more so he is a big advocate for musicians. And the and truth music. is with the dance world, is you need to, and you know this from theater, you need really large stages. Yeah, and big wide wides. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason that we just don't have it is that there are places they could potentially force themselves into. But to get the stage you need, you just don't have enough, enough venues in Denver for it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's really cool stuff. We're already nearing the end of the podcast. It's been a fun talk. I really appreciate you being here. Anybody else you want to shout out? Wonderbound's awesome. Any arts groups you love, venues you love, things that are coming up, lay it on us. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. There's nothing. That's, that's, <laughs> no, that's the thing about Denver right now is there's so much going on. And uh, mm. no, you know, I, I definitely think um, some of the stuff, the, the MCA you brought up, I do got to give a lot of credit to them. I think that what they're doing and the way they go about it is what people should be following. Yeah, um, me too. Uh, so I think that, you know, that's really interesting. Um, I think that if you are an artist or creative in Denver and you're feeling pushed out, take a deep breath and look at look at around you, you know, look and see what's happening in the cities just outside of Denver. You can still find a space. You don't need to totally leave the front range. Um, it may not be as cool as living in a you know abandoned area that is now gentrified, but don't fully go away. You do have people that are looking to create new spaces and new funding apparatuses for you. Um, yeah. And I, the only event I want to shout out is on Friday, we announced this Oregon Trail Live. So I work with History Colorado a little bit, trying <laughs> to help them do stuff. And um, Oregon um, Trail, the game. The game, like the game that we all grew up playing on our computers, our Apple IIs or whatever it started on. And yeah. we all played in school, in elementary school. Mm -hmm. um, we got the rights to that version. It's funny, like we call them up like, hey, can we do this event? Uh, and their only rule is, well, you can only use Oregon Trail, but it has to be pre-2002. <laughs> and we were sitting there being like, Oregon Trail 2003, I wouldn't even know what that is yeah. if it's not green and black. Yeah. Um, but it's going to be in History Colorado at the end of January. And uh, we just put up a little teaser page, just said it's coming. And we've had like a thousand people mm -hmm. say they're interested or that they're going, which is like, crazy that's almost viral to me yeah so uh so we'll see how that goes but i appreciate you guys having this of course um, good job with the podcast hopefully there is something interesting as opposed to just ranting for a few minutes but no that was great i we learned a lot yeah i'm the kind of person who finds this kind of stuff riveting i can't speak to the audience but i thought <laughs> that was great i mean i love i work for exo event center so event production and stuff is half of my life so yeah uh, i love hearing all that stuff well, go and check out the Oregon Trail event over at History Colorado. Check out Understudy a Space over at, uh, it's the Convention Center, technically? Literally, it's in the Convention Center. Technically, the Convention Center. So go and check that out. Uh, there's other things that are coming up. Check out the We Are Denver costume ball event. That's this Saturday at the Hilton over on Colorado. We're just doing a DIY costume space. Build your own costume, $100 costume contest prize. Come get some. Either way, we're here. We're doing stuff. Thank you guys so much for being with us. David Moak, everybody. And uh, Stephen Sampson sitting in on us, uh, listening to all the cool things being said. Yeah, give yourself a, a pat on the back. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys so much for being here. This is Il Fuminati. We are Denver Podcast. Love and peace, everyone. See you around.